Thank you, Stefan. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome also from my side. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to give you some tutorial on two topics, uh, actually. The first one is uh, to give you a first introduction into policy modeling uh, and social simulation. Actually, I think this fits very well as a kind of a some responses to uh, uh, Stephen uh, Basson's uh, discussion that we had before. And the second part is then uh, to look into um, a project where we have been doing uh, social simulation, aging-based modeling, and uh, where we have developed uh, tools for supporting the conceptual modeling uh, and analyzing the patterns that we were discussing before. So yeah, let's, uh, we, we have actually uh, two uh, units, uh, one before the break and one after the break. Uh, we have discussed that we can be a bit uh, flexible, so I will see when we'll stop and then have a lunch break and afterwards then uh, continue. And uh, I will hope, uh, I hope uh, that we just, oh, the pointer does not work properly. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, we've managed in the first uh, unit uh, the public policy making and social simulation introduction and then in the after lunch we'll look into the Okopomo project. Well, let's get started. Um, what are the challenges? Why are we thinking of uh, policy modeling since quite some time? Actually, um, if I recall, uh, Stefan was mentioning the, the research uh, we are involved in, um, I think Seven, eight years ago, the European Commission was quite eager to also support funding in this area of uh, policy modeling, bring together different disciplines from social scientists, psychology, as well as computer science and supporting uh, social simulation with uh, technical tools for better policy analysis. And the strategic motivation for that was actually that uh, we had the financial crisis, we had several crises in the world, among also those uh, um, that uh, Stephen was speaking before. And uh, one of the problems was, or is still, that we don't have, uh, well, I, want, I, I don't want to say proper tools, but at that very moment where we need policy analysis and understanding of strategic directions, the tools and the instruments used have failed to help us uh, um, um, take the, the right directions or uh, giving us the right insight into the right strategy decisions. So based on that uh, uh, challenges, uh, the Commission has, for the European Commission has funded quite some research in looking into combined approaches of uh, social simulation computer science approaches, uh, technology support, <coughs> as well as uh, psychology, uh, sociology approaches to better inform policy making and to include actually more active citizenship in that. So to let people also participate in such strategic decision making. However, for that, uh, we need also proper tools that help us visualize, that help us explain to the people what are the patterns are that guide and that structure certain area of policy and what we can do with that, getting a better understanding. So stakeholder engagement has also become uh, an important topic. So the challenges that we are facing are um, societal transitions, uh, economic uh, change, climate change, the current uh, challenges of uh, refugees, crisis, uh, uh, demographics uh, we have um, to master and we have to do this not just in short term but we have to uh, develop longer term strategic uh, positions and uh, strategies. Now in order to understand the context I'd like to give you a few understandings. Uh, first of all what is policy? When we talk about policy uh, we talk about public policies and policies at strategic layer so uh, governments, uh, uh, politicians making decisions in a, a, a strategic, in a policy domain. A policy domain could be like climate, uh, uh, migration as a policy area, as uh, uh, politicians call them, or um, uh, environment, uh, economics. These are the big uh, domains uh, where we talk about policy domains. 
And then Evans uh, defines a public policy as a set of, uh, or a courses of uh, actions, regulatory measures, laws, and funding priorities concerning a given uh, topic promulgated by a governmental entity or its representatives. Now, when we then talk about a policy, actually, political uh, layer, and also we in research in this area, we talk about strategy documents. A policy document that sets out exactly these courses of actions probably some regulatory uh, uh, agreements, laws that regulate a specific area. And of course, if we want to change something, we also need to affiliate uh, resources with that. That means uh, funding resources, uh, but also human resources, cap capacities that we need. And similarly, Cochran et al. in 2012 uh, refer by public policy as decisions of governments uh, that need governmental actions and uh, intentions. Also, th because we are at strategic layer, uh, often people say it is the kind of lip services that the political layer gives uh, to commit uh, change and investment in a certain policy area. Now, in the, if we think of the European domain, we have, for example, the digital single market strategy uh, policy area where within uh, the uh, European Union, uh, everybody should be able to freely move, work where they want, uh, without uh, administrative burdens, etc. Now, of course, with the Brexit, with the uh, Brits uh, having decided uh, to leave uh, that union, we have to see how things will also evolve. And it's a very interesting study now, what will happen uh, in terms of our strategy and policy decisions. Now, Policy is then very much, and uh, probably I should say one more word, there is also the term policy on a more technical layer, like uh, you may have heard about security policy, internet policy, which are actually guidelines or also assumptions on a more operational layer, how to use or how, not, uh, how to prevent uh, misuse uh, in a certain context. However, when we talk about policy, we are at the strategic layer, so we should not mix up uh, the two understandings. And then, in this context, there is, uh, um, from the political science, from the administrative science, always uh, the policy life cycle that has to be affiliated with this understanding. Meaning, uh, how it uh, et al. have uh, defined, uh, actually, a set of steps for defining such a policy. And that is, the first step is agenda setting, where people can say, OK, this government or this uh, parliament needs to deal with a topic. We are using certain instruments of e-participation for bringing a topic onto the agenda. Which ones, for example? Anybody is aware of that? Any ideas? Actually, you should be aware of that. We have talked, we have a, a, a group that tackles that topic. What is the instrument, a f even a formal instrument in Western democracies, to bring a policy topic onto the agenda of parliaments? And we are using, petitions. yes, petitions actually. Because the elections are different. Why are they different? Yes, and the purpose. Yes, but there is one other big difference. The election has the purpose to elect representatives in a, into a political uh, sphere that makes decisions. Whereas here, the petition, what is the objective of a petition? Well, to put something on the agenda of those elected politicians. Absolutely, and this can be a policy topic. And it, as you say, it can be. Any time, and we are using online tools actually for petitioning. Anybody? Uh, yeah. yeah but, uh, petition is, um, I would say, to try to beg or ask friendly the parliament to, uh, to discuss something. I would but not. Say, yeah. Then, if it is possible, like a referendum, you have an yeah. opinion. But 
Yeah. A referendum is yet another instrument of Western democracies. And I would not say that um, a, a petition is always a friendly begging of, uh, to the parliament to deal a top, uh, with a topic. Actually, uh, for example, in the German constitution, but also in other uh, Western democracies, we have um, said this in our constitutional law, that the citizens have the right uh, to petition and uh, we have an official site for petitioning at the German Bundestag. Um, and uh, this is actually forcing, if, we, if uh, the petition gets sufficient number of uh, signatures, then uh, the uh, parliament is actually forced to deal with the topic. So it's not a kindly asking, uh, friendly thing. Uh, it can also be really forcing. That's why it is called agenda setting. Then we are, we are walking along the policy life cycle. So the first step is putting something onto the agenda of uh, the government, the parliament. So and then, uh, assuming that people have uh, signed and uh, enough signatures have uh, been collected to bring it onto the agenda of the parliament, then the parliament has to treat this topic. And then we go into policy formulation, because then what is happening and what needs to be done, uh, people need to formulate a policy or a law or uh, a strategy to deal with this topic that has been brought onto the agenda. But before we, we go into this topic, I wanted to ask uh, some more examples of uh, petitioning solutions. Are you aware of that? Change the org, yes. Avas, yes. Or uh, Europe petition. There is also a European petition system. And in Germany, we have an e petition at the German Bundestag. And we have some others uh, in our course. We are studying also four different ones. I think uh, we now have the famous one from the British, which is saying we don't want to do it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> the Brits, uh, actually, the Brits were. Um, well, the Scottish Parliament was the first to set up an official online petitioning system, the Scottish Petitioner System, which was in turn of uh, 2003, 2004, actually the first formal one. Good. So we have some examples here. Now, the next step is then the Parliament uh, has to deal with the topic and uh, uh, has to come up uh, with a solution, with a proposal, with a, a law or a policy statement. And usually, when we talk about uh, our more uh, digital society, people want to be more involved. So we have different approaches and instruments, again, for engaging in uh, the policy discourse, in consultation, for example, for policy making, consultation for lawmaking, um, other forms of deliberation of a topic that has been brought onto the agenda of, of parliaments uh, and then uh, to be discussed and deliberated together. Now also here, as I already mentioned, um, uh, there are different uh, tools and instruments. Are you aware of some such examples where the citizens discuss together in terms of policy formulation to formulate together such a policy, a law, etc. Also here the European Commission has funded a lot of projects. Yeah, there's a lot of citizen assemblies and deliberation. Lots yes, absolutely. And there are different tools also for supporting this. This can be actually simple uh, web content management tools, but also social media platforms, uh, groups where such kind of this, uh, deliberation takes place. Yes? Yes. So I remember, I think in city Holstein, the north, northern part of Germany, there was, uh, or is now the discussion, or there was a discussion, where it is necessary to mention God in the constitution of city Holstein. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's, yeah, there's a, I remember, I think there's, there was a petition, petition to say, uh, or to have the opinion uh, to avoid this mention of God. 
was uh, I'm I'm not so aware of that. But was there a referendum, a petition, or a consultation? Because these are the things that we need to differentiate. Because the referendum would be here in the decision making, the next instrument. So yeah, we, we have uh, different consultation sites. Also, um, the European Commission uh, invites uh, experts in different policy domains uh, on the consultation. Uh, there was a consultation, for example, on the new e-government action plan in turn uh, December 2015, January 2016. The European Commission is currently um, updating its European interoperability framework. Also here there was a consultation, public consultation. So they have a consultation platform where they put uh, the, um, the ideas uh, from their own side there. And then uh, everybody is invited, usually these experts that participate in this kind of discussions, uh, to give their uh, voices. Turning now into the local level, uh, also there we do have uh, cases of uh, policy consultations and uh, policy formulations. For example, participatory budgeting. What is that about? And any example? Actually, Schleswig-Holstein also has uh, participatory budgeting cases. We're very famous is Colon here in Germany, but also uh, Porto Alegre, the traditional uh, form started in Brazil and it has uh, spread all over the world. Yeah. yeah. Any ideas what's happening with in within uh, participatory budgeting? What is happening there? Yeah. Citizens decide where funds should be allocated in their own communities. Absolutely. So, if uh, you are aware of uh, state budgeting, it is annual budgeting or biannual budgeting. And usually only the city council or the parliament decides on what the money is to be spent for. With participatory budgeting, actually, um, there are different uh, models for participatory budgeting. It is possible that either the citizens provide suggestions for what uh, the money or certain portion of the money should be spent for, or they can even decide on uh, what the money should be spent for. So they are involved here on policy formulation and up to decision making if the decision is then given also into the hands of uh, the citizens. Um, another, uh, I, I need to think, uh, you, your participatory budgeting, what is your topic? Uh, social media. Oh, policy, policy making. making in social media, yes. Um, we have another group that is in um, special planning. What is special planning about? Any ideas? What is that? Others call it also land use planning, yeah. rural planning. It is very much at the local layer. So municipalities, uh, cities, and this is where Exactly. <laughs> this is, uh, at least for example, also in Germany, it is uh, uh, formally in the constitutions that people uh, need to be heard uh, when it comes to, well, for example, here there should be an industry zone, uh, and then people have a right to be heard, to have their opinion, whether this is good or not, or what their concerns are, and this needs to be taken into account. Uh, and, uh, for example, there was a very famous uh, um, land use planning here in Germany uh, on the Frankfurt airport when they constructed uh, the, uh, the new terminal. And the new, sorry, not the new terminal, but the, the new landing uh, test. So that was a huge, also online consultation where uh, people were informed and where they could uh, give their own suggestions for how to, to plan what. And it's becoming more and more famous now also to use uh, land use planning or to do special planning over the internet because uh, geographical uh, data, geoinformation is uh, much more available and all these overlay uh, mashups, uh, etc. functionalities that uh, the web provides can be used and helps the people 
very easily to express their opinion and to share their ideas, etc. Now, then we come into, in the policy life cycle, decision making. This is about then, well, people have uh, discussed, there was a deliberation on uh, the topics, and now a decision has to be taken. Howard and Ramesh uh, life cycle, or Howlett et al., is, is some more authors, uh, actually does not distinguish between technology and uh, traditional policy life cycle. So decision making in the tr traditional way takes them place in the city council or in parliament, etc. And with the use of the media, the new media, the web, uh, it is possible uh, and there's a big um, demand now to involve people very much also in decision making. Now, as I mentioned, for example, the participatory budgeting, um, it is not very often the case that the people really decide on uh, the budget. When it comes to land use planning, uh, very often the final decision then, though, is still in the hands of the uh, governments, the parliaments, the city councils. Uh, not necessarily, no. Actually, uh, this is a very much uh, strategic politically and also psychological factor. I mean, if we have a representative democracy and if then the people decide, decision, make the decisions, what is the role of the politicians then and the elected representatives? Yeah, do the people know, know enough to make the decision? Uh, well, in many cases, yes, I would say, because uh, the... Mm, the platforms that provide the participation facilities, they uh, give all the information necessary. However, uh, in this case, it's very often it is really where the people have an interest on local side, like uh, land use planning. They are aware and they, they have uh, combinations usually of public hearings as well as online discussions and information on that. Or also in the participatory budgeting, there's a combination of a uh, uh, channels uh, for providing the information. And uh, of course, people have different opinions and uh, there are pros and cons, but one aspect is then that the politicians are kind of fearing that they lose power if they give too much decision making into the hands of the, the people. That's one thing. Oops. Um, another thing uh, is then that, um, yeah, um, Sometimes uh, the e-participation turns out that only those really interested are participating and those who, well, didn't find the time, whatever, believe the government will decide everything uh, for their good, uh, they don't care so much, whatever, they don't participate in the end. So there may be an asymmetry of opinions. So uh, the, the government actually has tend to take care of uh, a balanced decision making. Now we couldn't of course ask uh, whether this has really been done and uh, treated uh, to neutralize uh, positions and uh, not uh, take the opinion of those activists that really have an interest to make the particular change. So this is another aspect that we need to take into consideration where in the end the technology is the enabler, is the facilitator, but we also need to reflect the, the procedures and uh, uh, the rule of law, uh, the good governance principles. I've seen two hands also, one here, one there. Who wants to start? Um, yes. Uh, not so, well, we have uh, just recently done an empirical study on the participatory budgeting in, um, in uh, Bonn city uh, and uh, the respondents are rather uh, with a higher education, uh, not necessarily between, there's a gender issue, mm. but uh, they are rather having a higher education level. So this may be a difference. However, we see also other and this is where social media come in very intensively, other environments where really the people push a lot through the opinions on the simple media like Twitter, Facebook, etc. And this is then more widespread. Yeah. So if you have the example Brexit, 
Yeah. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yes, and this, I think, is uh, coming back to the first point that I made, certain responsibility still with the elected representatives in the end. However, uh, if people want more engagement, this is the game. If you participate, then you, your verse, voice has a chance to be heard. If you're not participating, you go with the, those who make decisions. This is the democratic game, isn't it? So uh, w certainly, this is not uh, an issue that technology can resolve, because there are other inherent problems of uh, distrust in democracy that we need to resolve instead of um, technology. But I'm, I'm going back to my, uh, yeah. my idea of asymmetry of information. Yeah. Uh, in France, there is a, there's an, a new problem now um, on the airport of Nantes. Yeah. They are moving the airport to another place called Notre Dame des Landes. Yeah. And so the people were consulted in a referendum mm -hmm. to make the decision if they were to move the airport. Yeah. But the people were complaining because uh, to validate the, the, the modification mm -hmm. of, of, of a place, uh, 20 reports were made available to the people online mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. people to make the decision. Yeah. But uh, uh, some of the activists defending the, the, the uh, who are against moving the airport yeah. to the new place said, Yes, but uh, five other reports have been produced by independent sources, mm -hmm. but they are invisible on the web. Yeah. So if you search for them, you can't find them because yeah. the, 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 the pro-government has, mm. has put so much power into information. And yeah. So there's an asymmetry between the available information for yeah. the pro against the... the yeah. The um, and this is where we need to discuss about the trust in the end uh, into the government because... Uh, <laughs> Well, then we, uh, we come back to the discussion we had yeah. earlier. We need to understand from the different sides, mm -hmm. not only from one discipline, but uh, we need to go further into psychology, minds of people, and even um, historical uh, evolution of uh, ethics and values. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in the end, this is how these values have been shaped over the time. Yeah, 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 absolutely. We need then to think about uh, public values. But what I'm saying is like the tools, the yeah. web can be, uh, th th there are ways to uh, modify the neutrality of the web by, yeah. by pushing up content that yeah. will make people yeah. believe that absolutely. it's absolutely. the only viable content. Uh, you gave very good examples with uh, the fake um, um, example that you gave before. Uh, I think. Uh, in this regard, we have a new duty of research. We need to understand better how to assure data quality, how to ensure it over the time, and to see who is responsible uh, for providing the right quality of data. So, uh, and also, uh, we need to understand the capacities and the competences that people need in order to understand fake information on the web or missing information on the web and uh, to um, get active in these regards and to say, OK, we need this. Just add to that, yeah. that that's not a problem that exists only on the web, is it? Because yes, on the web, it's way easier to access information, but you have the exact same or even worse problem that you would have mm. 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 like 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, but isn't that the kind of transition we are undergoing in our uh, social life from the traditional way to the digital way? We are doing everything more digital now. We are get, uh, developing expectations also towards the web that we find all the information there. 
Uh, and uh, I think what we need is uh, to get better training and to build up capacities that we are able to reflect and assess how valid is that kind of information that I get there. And where else can I find it? I think also the, the league groups, uh, this kind of activist groups, are very, very important in, the, in this content, uh, uh, context to provide in the future more openness. And this is the kind of, in, in our f research field, we, we talk about uh, the responsibility and uh, becoming adult uh, to participate more actively instead of this passive, okay, um, our representative uh, um, politicians do that kind of uh, work. We want to, be get, uh, to get more active ourselves in this domain. That's what uh, drives also our research. So uh, I think, yes, on the one side, uh, the traditional way had this problem also, but uh, with the internet, we get new possibilities and opportunities that we want to exploit also, we want to participate. Uh, and uh, if we look into strategies uh, of uh, um, um, Europe 2020 here in Germany, uh, um, Digital Administration 2020, they all have this uh, citizen participation, uh, German, in German it's called Teilhabe, of the population in the activities. Very, very prominent uh, since, yeah, I would say 10 years or so. So I think this is, an evolution towards digital transformation we are undergoing. And so it opens new possibilities, but also new expectations. And we need to, and this uh, brings new challenges that we need, I think as a researchers, uh, need to resolve, like uh, understanding and providing uh, uh, the methods for assuring data quality, where I think we have still some gaps. We have uh, been doing uh, quite something, I think, now on uh, data analysis. Uh, however, uh, how to ensure uh, the quality of data and how to uh, also understand the chain of value of these data assets, I think it's uh, very, very important where we still have to learn something. I, I think it's, it's all the data quality, I agree with that. But I think it's also storytelling. I mean, uh, in previous yeah. times, I mean, the, the media would tell a story. Yeah. some very limited data insight. Yeah. But uh, now if you, if you only have formal documents, mm. they are really not accessible to most people, including most of the time mm. myself, mm. right? Mm. Uh, <laughs> because you don't understand it. And you yeah. Know, you have some data, there is not a story in there. And uh, well, we, well, we need ways to convey the information mm. in a way that's understandable to yeah. people. And, and also administration is quite often resistant. I um, think of this example yeah. Where there was this uh, initiative, it was a non governmental initiative to just place the decisions of the town council on a map of Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. And so you would basically see oh, here they decided to invest into the kindergarten, and here they decided to invest into mm -hmm. the bridge, mm -hmm. and so on. And, and the Frankfurt town council, I think that was really against it when it was all public information, mm -hmm. like all mm -hmm. the town council decisions yeah. are public yeah. information. Yeah. And they were for several years, they were really mm. strongly against publishing this in a way that would yeah. be yeah. understandable for mm. the people because you could look mm. what, what's happening mm. in your environment mm. and mm. you don't care about yeah. the other part of town, it's yeah. not like big city. And until they at some point really said, okay, now, yeah, okay, it seems to be fruitful, we adopt it. Yeah. And yeah. It took years for this non governmental mm. initiative mm. To, mm. to be able to present the information in a way that right. was relevant. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I, I agree on that. And I think one of the big challenges that we still have not resolved in this regard is uh, that the, the people in the town uh, administration have not the knowledge. They are not trained in providing this kind of information over the internet. It's slowly progressing now. Um, there are uh, smaller teams installed in bigger cities, not in the small villages still, uh, that uh, should have or that have the capacities and competences for internet communication, be this uh, Facebook groups, the website, uh, designs, etc. But this was, I think, uh, a transition of uh, at least half a deca decade. Yeah. It was. Just the willingness, right? Yeah. In my example, it was yeah. not about, it, it, it wasn't about 
was not about actually even doing work. Yeah. It was really just even making the documents available as yeah. a PDF. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and yeah. not <coughs> trying to stop yeah. the people who yeah. <laughs> are doing something. However, coming back to data quality, one, one other aspect that currently is discussed a lot in, uh, in, in uh, the context also with uh, governments, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of uh, the open government data initiatives and the platforms with the data provided there. Now, there's a lot of discussion on data quality. What kind of liability do government uh, take when they provide this data? And if then somebody, private or uh, civic uh, sector actor, uh, takes this information, enriches it with some other information, and then provides some information that is not fully uh, correct, who is liable for that incorrect information? So uh, I think uh, in this context, we, we have to progress and do further research. Yeah. So there were some policies implemented by some governments yeah. to encourage only uh, open standards and open source. Well, I, I, think, I think in this regard, uh, we have to also ask then, is government sufficiently staffed for uh, and has it the right competences to provide the data in the formats that we need? And what responsibility does civil and private sector actors also have in terms of collaboration, and there are new initiatives now for this co-creative environment uh, and uh, co-creation, co-production um, in the public uh, sector to, for example, do this together. So the one provides the data, another one uh, transforms them into machine-readable formats uh, up to the standards, etc. And then uh, also for the analysis and for providing the information in a language that uh, is understandable by citizens, it's not always uh, the responsibility on also, uh, only of the government. It can also be the uh, community uh, contribution that uh, people can give. Which brings us to a next paradigm. Yeah. They have interest maybe for yeah. nations and national or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, on users and human beings, yeah, mm -hmm. and what is maybe helpful is uh, there is yeah, maybe a movement emphasizing we have the interest yeah, of human beings and mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. nations mm -hmm. and Yeah. Um, so if you um, have this um, label above, and then yeah, of, you can decide on your own. Of course, there are a couple of other companies, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, then you can trust mm -hmm. and say, okay, there are uh, people they think of yeah, a few things mm -hmm. that they want to improve, yeah, or like. Yeah, and yeah. I'm yeah. Maybe you. That would have been that argument to have the exact same goals and aspirations. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you have this label, for example, then people are aware if they maybe it's a platform or whatever a website. Uh, if people uh, try to post something, uh, idea or just uh, say mm. they want something mm. to change, and uh, you say um, be aware yeah, to think of all human beings, then uh, there's a selection of ideas already by the users. They mm. think okay. Mm. Well, I think we need to be more selective in this kind of understanding. Uh, I think 
that the, and in this regards I agree with you, the internet as such, it's of course for global scope. However, when we uh, want to discuss things locally, we want to use it as well. And uh, there are a number of uh, social media that allow and that foster actually and have a lot of local groups. And this is where people, and this is where we come back to the context of uh, e-participation and uh, also policy making, where the people are most interested in, um, in local context, in the, con in the aspects that concern me locally, that have an impact on my local social life. So this is where I'm interested. However, uh, of course, we are using our uh, social media accounts also to communicate to the world. And I think uh, we need to enable both, and we need to have the right type of discussions, depending on what uh, my interests are. There are uh, quite a lot of uh, WhatsApp groups uh, where people coordinate in their social environments, uh, be this in uh, associations for sports, for leisure, whatever. Uh, and this can also happen in local communities that interact with the governments both here in policy formulation as well as uh, then in probably policy uh, implementation as well as uh, evaluation. And uh, I think we need to separate the two things. The one is really to go out, to communicate to the outside world, uh, and then the other one is where we not always want to share our minds with everybody, but really to constrain it to smaller groups. And, uh, Certainly, we can discuss about uh, whether the e-participation platforms that the governments are building up uh, are always the right tool for that kind of communication. However, their rationale is also very often, we want to have this local participation. We want to have those people interested from the local context and not from everywhere in the world. So these are uh, different aspects that we need to consider when we uh, look into global uh, discussions as well as uh, local. Now coming back to our uh, policy life cycle. Now decision making would be, for example, the referendum or uh, polling uh, mechanisms where we have made decisions uh, then on the policy formulated. Now, policy implementation regards, and now the uh, decision is made, and now um, the government is implementing um, laws, it's uh, uh, implementing policies, etc. However, people would also need to be informed all the time. We have in Germany, for example, now I think uh, three or four states that have uh, approved a transparency act. That means decisions made by the government and then implementations require that the data on the performance are being provided. That can go up to, for example, government is uh, procuring a lot of uh, services and goods that it is made transparent who has won uh, a bit, uh, what it costs, uh, who were the competitors, how long is the contract. We have, for example, these issues of Stuttgart 21, the Berlin uh, airport, where a lot of things are very, very intransparent. And people, and here I mean the implementation of the policy made, because the decision for the uh, Stuttgart uh, train station was made in the 90s. Then it has become more expensive and more expensive. So this is policy implementation and policy evaluation. And uh, uh, for this also we need uh, the appropriate tools and uh, the transparency acts provide the legal grounds at least uh, for providing that information. However, we are not so f f uh, far progressed yet uh, in really implementing this kind of transparency. Although we have concepts of open government, the open data uh, policies, but still we, I would say we are at infancy stages we still have to progress that much more. We don't leave that transparency, and there's a lot of distrust in this kind of uh, change, uh, especially from the government side. <coughs> Any question from your side? No? no? Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, hmm? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Good, and yeah, the policy evaluation also here, um, 
as I said before, people should be enabled to look at what happened and uh, um, how much did a policy cost, how was it implemented, has it achieved its ob objectives, etc. So also evaluating the decisions that have been made here in this earlier stage. And that leads again to the next cycle of uh, agenda setting uh, to make changes, of course. So this is the policy life cycle in this context of uh, policy making. Now, uh, returning a bit uh, to our definitions and understanding, um, policy making then uh, is defined by Estrada, for example, as uh, the work that is supported by the use of different theories as well as quantitative and qualitative models and techniques to analytically evaluate the past, so the causes and the future, the effects of any policy on society anywhere at any time. So we are using and we should use uh, different uh, research methods uh, and different data sources combining uh, um, different uh, instruments also and different research disciplines. In this regards then policy making Having discussed uh, transparency, open government, and uh, uh, what we expect by the policy life cycle with uh, more active citizen engagement, also uh, looking into uh, alternative decision making. So again, this comes back to the information provision and uh, that people are enabled to really uh, make decisions, to have the right information, to have sufficient uh, exhaustive information that there is no information asymmetry, etc., and that the information that is provided is of uh, good quality for the decision making. And that includes uh, different uh, stakeholders, that's why we look into e-participation and collaborative uh, policy making, etc., and uh, as already mentioned, different disciplines need to collaborate here. Um, I do have uh, some more uh, aspects here on policy making, I think uh, we have uh, discussed uh, most of them. Um, so also here we start with uh, societal problems uh, at the beginning and we have complexity involved, complex processes, so it's not just uh, simply uh, communicating something. Uh, stakeholders have uh, very often different opinions that need to be balanced, that's why deliberation and uh, often uh, moderation and uh, particularly also mediation is important. And uh, we need to bring the different understandings uh, together, uh, which uh, have certain constraints. Uh, we may need to make uh, trade-off uh, decisions, etc. cetera. Uh, not always have uh, very clear evaluation criteria in mind, etc. And of course, uh, political uh, ideologies play also a very important role. Um, yeah, looking again into the uh, policy life cycle, this is the four uh, inner um, uh, squares and what they can bring uh, in uh, engaging people in policy uh, <coughs> making along the life cycle and combining that also with uh, uh, public value assets uh, is uh, in the outer uh, circle here, defined. For example, policy formulation, uh, reflecting the will of the people, uh, having uh, uh, their voices heard, uh, balancing also the interests, listening, involving the citizens, and uh, basing on evidences that can be uh, um, um, quantitative data, but also qualitative statements like uh, opinions, uh, storytelling was mentioned by uh, Stefan before. Policy implementation, so then looking into having made decisions, uh, accountability, uh, timeliness, uh, reliable, uh, flexible, efficient, robust uh, decisions and implementations that are uh, being done, conforming to uh, the decisions made. On the execu execution layer, then uh, looking into transparency, um, equal access, efficiency, fairness, uh, honesty, responsiveness, uh, protection of individual rights. And uh, policy enforcement and uh, evaluation, again, evidence-based, uh, so being able to assess, uh, based on evidence, the performance, uh, the achievements of goals, etc. Uh, again, accountability, fairness, and transparency in this regard. 
These are um, attributes or characteristics, public value characteristics that guide us then in the implementation and the provision of uh, uh, policy making uh, instruments and supporting uh, in the policy decision making. However, what are the challenges? I think uh, we discussed that already a bit, uh, so don't need to go into much detail here. Um, complexity for modeling uh, social problems. Uh, we need different disciplines to be involved uh, to bring together different uh, understandings, different paradigms, but also we need to explore uh, the different tools that are already available. However, the tradition is a bit different. It's uh, the fragmentation that we have to cope with this. So the need is then to bring this together and uh, the research in policy making, or there's also a kind of a research discipline, I'm not sure if you've heard about that, policy informatics that br tries to bring together uh, the approaches from the different disciplines or uh, uh, social science, uh, uh, computational social science, I think, uh, will also be a very important contribution here, web science uh, among them as well. That brings together the, the good governance principles, as I mentioned before, the digital sciences, uh, the in multidisciplinary uh, understanding, and helps us then in the modeling of uh, 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 the different uh, problems, policy problems that we need to investigate and that we need to bring forward uh, on which we need to make decisions along the policy life cycle. So um, policy modeling is then applied to different stages in the policy life cycle. Um, we can use, for example, the petitioning as uh, the starting point for the agenda setting, but then on the po policy formulation, we, uh, and I will uh, give you an example in the afternoon with the Okobomo project, uh, use uh, conceptual modeling tools for uh, structuring the patterns. You, you were mentioning also the patterns. For structuring these patterns uh, that help us understand the complex aspects from the different disciplines of a policy domain. The different uh, stakeholder concerns, uh, the different uh, conditions we need to follow, but also the causal relationships of, of aspects. Understanding also, for example, historical evolution of uh, certain opinions of, uh, of people and why they, for example, move into a, uh, and follow Islamic State, as you were explaining before. Now, in our context, we were focusing, because it was European projects, on uh, some European uh, areas like knowledge transfer, uh, renewable energy policy, and the like, or uh, housing, social housing policy in London, where people have different opinions and this need to be balanced. And helping people then to understand the different aspects is uh, to help visualize, uh, first of all, to help identify and structure the different patterns and then to help visualize uh, how these different patterns relate to each other, how they may influence each other in terms of a causal chain. If one event happens, uh, what uh, are the options uh, for the subsequent step, etc. And that means we need to bring together different theories and paradigms of uh, modeling and simulation, like uh, uh, different paradigms of uh, modeling and simulation are aging-based modeling, macroeconomic uh, modeling or system dynamics, statistical modeling, uh, micro-level modeling, for example. Are you all familiar with these kinds of uh, modeling? Yeah, I see nodding. Good, so I don't need to explain that. Good. What we then further need is uh, the ICT support for that, uh, combining the different uh, uh, approaches uh, and um, then uh, reflecting also good governance principle in this kind of uh, engagement using these instruments. That means uh, bringing in the ICT, for example, in the policy formulation uh, and in the agenda setting, opinion mining, uh, sentiment analysis as it is done in web uh, analysis, uh, or uh, serious game simulations in the policy formulation and decision making. Um, 
then in the policy implementation, uh, sensors, uh, analysis, uh, visualization, etc., and combined with the evaluation, then, for example, uh, online dashboards that help us uh, analyze uh, the different um, aspects of the policy implemented and uh, to measure it uh, with the data that we get from the implementation. And uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, that is not to be done only by the government in closed uh, shops, but that is really to involve the people in terms of our stakeholder engagement, in terms of citizen participation uh, on all of these stages, like here in the opinion mining sentiment analysis, not only that people contribute their opinion, uh, if we think in terms of co-creation, co-production uh, then, actually people also help us analyze, uh, help us uh, reflect and uh, make uh, uh, suggestions uh, in terms of uh, formulating a policy. Um, or that means, uh, for example, uh, involving research uh, also in uh, exploring social simulation tools of different paradigms that I was showing before, so that people design a policy uh, model, they implement the policy model, the program, such, and they explore different alternatives of patterns in the simulation to see uh, and to test uh, policy options to inform themselves, but also to, to share the ideas and the, uh, the, the lessons uh, with others. And the same can happen in then also with, uh, for example, the open dashboards, uh, where people then together uh, develop the evaluation uh, patterns and uh, uh, measure, etc. Yeah, and this means uh, we need to bring together uh, different, and we need to bring in different uh, concepts and different uh, solutions, existing solutions, but also new innovations in areas like big and open data, crowdsourcing, visualization, and gaming, where the research on policy modeling is uh, actually quite uh, prominent. What are the aspects uh, that we need to bring in here, for example, in context of uh, open and uh, big data? Uh, the, the government's bringing data. We collect a lot of data from Internet of Things. Uh, we expect greater return on investment uh, and uh, use uh, the creation of outputs uh, from the citizens through crowdsourcing, etc. cetera. Uh, and understand the value of data uh, by uh, combining the data, generating new value add through uh, enriching data. And the open data enables then citizens and others to be involved in the policy making process by providing the access, by using the tools and uh, uh, transferring activities from inside the border of the government to engage together with the citizens in the end. Yeah? How does the data of IOT help the government or any public institution? Sorry, can you repeat? How does the data of IOT, Internet of Things, yeah. help, help any public, any public or any government? Yeah, for example, um, in the uh, New York State, uh, there is um, sensor data on pollen um, uh, or air pollution that can uh, be collected and then help uh, those uh, people with allergies uh, with an app to inform, okay, don't go in this area. Uh, it might be uh, not good for you because uh, of health issues, etc. It's just one example. Uh, I think also in, uh, in the cybercrime, uh, in the surveillance, uh, we can use a lot of... Uh, the sensor data that will help us also to understand, however, and uh, to, to alert people in the end. Also in uh, um, rescue management, in uh, emergency management, uh, in healthcare, uh, yeah, we have many areas where I think uh, the topic is uh, evolving now, so it's, uh, it's not that we have everything resolved already, it's uh, an upcoming area of research and evolution. However, having this done also over time, uh, the sensor data uh, will help us, for example, um, for uh, micro simulations for time series from the observation uh, that we can explore in the crowd, by citizens, etc. in the future. 
and also then, for example, to discuss about climate change issues, to understand better. So there's a lot of potential in this area. However, not everything is resolved yet. Yeah, I think on the crowdsourcing, uh, uh, we have already uh, said quite some, some words. Uh, so the potential is using the web, uh, using the internet really to engage the people. Uh, and uh, we have seen quite some examples uh, um, um, in, in this area. Also some uh, where uh, the Arab Spring, uh, where people have used the technologies. And uh, here in, in Europe, co-production, co-creation uh, are um, topics that are currently extensively discussed uh, with uh, governments uh, because the government side still is very hesitant actually to implement this kind of co-creation, co-production. Where we have seen it work very, very well is, uh, hello, in the, in the uh, 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 voluntary sector, uh, be this fire brigades or be this also um, in the context of uh, refugee management where people are organizing themselves uh, in uh, social media groups uh, or in, uh, together with uh, the government in local environments to manage uh, refugee streams, etc., which is not always uh, communicated extensively to, to the wide world. However, it is happening in the local environments, and uh, this is where really the added value is being created in this kind of co-creation environments. Yeah, and uh, what is very, very important is then uh, the visualization and uh, also the gaming. Uh, uh, I would say in, in the European spheres, uh, citizen participation when it comes to government, government decision making, it is uh, very often perceived uh, not as a pleasure, but as uh, some obligation, some duty. And if we turn this into some uh, uh, kind of entertainment, uh, some uh, joyful pleasure, uh, to play around us, to experiment, I think we'll get also much more attraction and uh, citizen participation in this environment. And for this, we need uh, the, the competences and uh, uh, the means uh, that are available from uh, visualization using computer tools. Yeah, there is a study from uh, Janssen and Helbig. Uh, Marijn Janssen is uh, from TU Delft, Natalie Helbig was working at the uh, Center for Technology in Government at the uh, uh, Albany University, New York State University, Albany. She's now moved, I think, uh, to a, uh, a government in the, she, I think she is now in uh, a responsible uh, program manager in healthcare ministry or department of uh, <coughs> New York State. Uh, and yeah, they uh, evaluated uh, the impact of policy making using um, the concepts that we have been discussing before uh, along the different uh, policy life cycle steps, supporting policy development and what impact can be uh, uh, created on the governance. And the governance means here uh, the interaction between the state and the citizens and the, uh, the private sector and the contributions are uh, the benefits that are being generated here, like uh, problem definition and agenda setting, collecting the data by the citizens uh, as a policy development, uh, like the, the census that we have been mentioning before. And uh, the impact on the governance is that the, the citizens can identify problems. Uh, uh, they can raise petitions for agenda setting, so they create more actively um, uh, um, topics for the political discussion and contribute their research to the dialogue also raise voices uh, to be heard uh, better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in policy enforcement, what do you mean by citizens and businesses monitoring the technology? Uh, they monitor government activity. That means, uh, does the government uh, really perform according to the objectives? Uh, have the objectives uh, been met? Uh, is it is in time in the budget constraints as defined, as we discussed before, Stuttgart 21, uh, after the decision has been made, after uh, people have started, or the government has started, or the train agency has started to construct, uh, uh, to start the reconstruction, um, then it becomes more and more expensive, new uh, insights uh, uh, 
were communicated through the media, but making this more transparent uh, uh, would mean that people can and businesses can monitor this using uh, the technology, meaning that, for example, the data is provided openly uh, at a government platform. So for instance, one, one of the arguments of the project would be uh, this is reducing pollution, let's say, and yeah. you put sensors everywhere and people could have access to the data of the sensors yeah. to see if the pollution has effectively been reduced by the project. This could be one objective. Uh, I would not uh, see this in the Stuttgart 21 because I don't think that they will install uh, sensors for pollution measurement, but uh, at least uh, uh, more traffic, more people that can be transported, this could be monitored. Uh, however, in this regard, I was rather referring to the budget spending because it's still <laughs> not finalized it's th and it's uh, extended and extended and more money needs to go into, uh, which is not <coughs> kept transparent. So it's just one example. There are many, many such examples. However, the point is here uh, uh, in the enforcement, uh, this is really then looking into this is running now, um, and uh, people are monitoring it through, for example, sensor data, and they are able to use this technology. Yeah, there is uh, an example from the Netherlands, also uh, published in uh, Janssen and Helbig, uh, Government Information Quarterly is one of our uh, journals that is uh, quite renowned in our domain, where different such studies are being published. And uh, they have uh, this uh, self-organization uh, example from uh, earthquake uh, in the north of the Netherlands uh, and uh, explain how this can all work when we do <coughs> policy modeling using uh, the technologies that are being available. Yeah. Including the different uh, visualizations, etc taking uh, into consideration sentiments of people and uh, visualizing that also in the environment. Now, that means new capabilities coming in, new roles coming in policy making. Uh, it's not an isolated exercise anymore when we involve the people more with the technology available. Uh, however, uh, policy makers need also to be facilitated uh, uh, and uh, need to orchestrate uh, the processes uh, in the co-creative uh, environment. It's not that the government have the process and the people are participating and uh, engaging on the other side and this is never pro uh, brought together. Uh, this is actually a very important aspect that um, when we do citizen participation in policy making environments, uh, this needs to be well integrated with the traditional processes of decision making. And, uh, uh, making uh, data more openly available, etc. And uh, in one of our research projects, uh, EGAF Polynet, we have studied a lot uh, the different approaches to policy making and have then in the end come up also with a set of grand challenges of research. I'm uh, not going to uh, explain that uh, in much detail, but uh, I can provide the slides to that. And th the five grand challenges that we identified in this domain uh, are on the one side content-wise data and information characteristics and use and this was also one of the reasons for asking for the data quality. Uh, this is one of the studies uh, that uh, is needed there. Modeling and simulation, how to better explore these paradigms and the tools that are available uh, from the agenda setting to uh, the evaluation uh, and uh, using the capabilities that we have from the technology side and uh, uh, enabling the people to use them effectively. The citizen and stakeholder engagement is still uh, some research that we need to understand uh, uh, biases, we need to understand the motivations of people, also the uh, background, etc., capabilities. Also, we, we discussed about the government capabilities, uh, an issue that uh, uh, people also from the government side need to be willing, need to be enabled uh, to use this types of uh, technology for policy making and including uh, the monitoring at the end. And in our research, uh, we also identified one challenge that is translating research results into policy actions and practice. Now, we have very often great ideas, we have great projects, but uh, how do they really then translate into uh, the use, uh, into the policy actions of the government? This is uh, also some issue that we uh, very often 
phase and uh, yeah, need to better understand how we can do this kind of knowledge transfer. And I think this is the point where I would suggest to stop for break. And uh, we will then discuss in the afternoon one example of uh, policy modeling, the Okopomo policy modeling. And yeah, if you have any further questions for the first part of our tutorial, then we can go. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Certainly, this is a topic um, where uh, non native English speakers may have uh, wrong use of the words sometimes. When we talk about uh, public value, we mean the contribution of an action that uh, uh, brings value to the society as a whole. And uh, to measure that kind of public value in general, uh, certain values, public values, can be defined. But there are probably different, and these are the variables that in the end uh, contribute to the public value in the end. And uh, yeah, uh, these are certainly systematizations uh, that are understood in different uh, domains, probably different. <coughs> So, yeah, in, in my domain, we understand the public value as the general contribution to society, and the values are the individual variables uh, with which and characteristics with which we can measure the value to the public. If you have a different background, uh, you may have a different understanding. And if you are native, you may have also different understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you need to. One needs then to distinguish uh, values from the point of view that you consider. If you take it from the corporation view, the corporation delivering values, it can be to the general public, and then we talk about the sum of them being public value, <coughs> and it can be values that are uh, relevant for its own business, for the corporation's business, but not necessarily public value can be also economic, personal interest values that uh, shape up the values of a corporation. And if we talk about public value, it is not only a corporation that contributes to the achievement of public value, but it can be the businesses well, or private people, individuals, citizens as well, politicians, different groups. Yeah. The logic of policy, of good yeah. policy and good governance, mm -hmm. but goes to the ethics of this kind of, uh, of um, super optimized uh, yeah. decision making process that goes into something that I think that it's less human, even if you think that humans are more involved into the process. Yeah. We, we can end up with a process where data, data process, data modeling, and uh, uh, a decision that is based on uh, sensors and uh, mm. a validation and a control that is based on sensors would actually remove the human part of decision making mm. to go into something like machines would produce data, mm -hmm. data would optimize the best decision, mm -hmm. the best decision would be taken by the machine, and mm -hmm. the machine would provide the evaluation of mm. the process and validate if it's good or not. Mm. It, my, my problem with this kind of, uh, of model, it's, it looks like more human, but it, in the end, it's less and less human in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's dishumanizing, like, decisions. Yeah. Because humans are yeah. take bad decisions. Machines are not supposed to. Well, machines are as good as uh, humans program them and uh, program their learning algorithms, aren't they? I mean, we had in our yes, faculty sometimes this they kind of discussion. Humans do play with the data. Humans can, if you were talking about corporations, then 
yeah. it's obvious. The interest is obvious in, yeah. in any yeah. policy making. Yeah. Yeah. There are groups of interest. There are some inter sometimes people take bad decisions that end up good, like to be good for the for the for the common good. Yeah, well, I think in this regard, uh, we come back again to uh, the starting point, uh, more or less. Um, if we assume that the politicians still are the representatives to take, in the end, final decisions, the tools should be supportive to them, and also they should be supportive to the people to make decisions. Now, if we then look into research on artificial intelligence and machine learning, etc., then certainly um, the developments I, and the, the I, expectations are that machines can compensate for human decision making. Mm. However, I think we in public policy, we are still in an area where I think that will not happen for a long time. Because, I hope so. Uh, of course, but I mean, this is a f philosophical discourse that we will uh, lead to. However, I think uh, the, the, the benefits of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning are uh, really to support us uh, in this decision making. And it's not then that the machine in the end makes the decision, but that the people that have to make the decision are enabled to play with the options, to assess these options with simulations and games, uh, and then to make the decision in the end. Not that the machine replaces the human. And I think it is our responsibility that we keep this uh, principle of uh, final human decision making, but exploring the technology facilities, because it helps us better grasping the complexity of a policy domain that we otherwise, uh, we discussed earlier, in the traditional way, uh, paper-based, uh, you cannot comprehend that much uh, at I the same time. So <laughs> I think the benefits of technology are certainly there. However, we need also to be careful with the use and how far we go with uh, the machines compensating our own activities. I would be one more person optimistic as you are if I, we didn't have some examples like uh, high-frequency finance, yeah. for instance, trading. Yeah. That has completely been overtaken by machines, yeah. where, and where human decision has completely disappeared from yeah. from uh, the ethics of business, mm -hmm. which is why people put money into investing yeah. into something they believe in, and they end up financing something they don't believe in. Because well, the machine has decided that it's more uh, interesting to invest in uh, oil drilling in uh, Alaska yeah. than yeah. helping poor people in Africa. I'm I'm aware of that uh, development. Uh, however. Um, I think we are responsible ourselves that we have this kind of decisions uh, taken by machines. Mm. If we allow them, uh, it is our responsibility, isn't it? Yes, it, it I mean, that's, that's what I'm who would be able to stop that? It would be the humans, not the machine. Mm. And uh, if uh, the finance industry thinks that this is valuable, uh, I know that uh, it is uh, affiliated with risk. And then I think we need to get back to the point uh, of uh, learning from history. I mean, uh, every failure, uh, I've, I'm not sure if you have heard uh, just a few days ago, um, the autonomous car had its first uh, accident with a debt. I mean, this is learning experience. I'm sorry to say that, but this is how we progress. We learn from disasters. We learn from the bad things, not from the good things. And this is how we evolve and how we make things better because we study the problem then more prominently. And giving you an example from the German context and um, refugee management uh, and uh, political collaboration. Um, usually it is very difficult in the German federal system that uh, the different layers collaborate. Now we had these refugee streams. It was possible within half a year to set up a refugee information management system in a collaboration of the different layers in half a year because all had a problem and all needed to resolve it quickly and it works now. But this was one case and uh, if we then are again relaxed more because we have no pressure, it will not work again and this is uh, how we are. So we can learn from that but uh, so we... I'm just 99% optimistic, not just one. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, I agree with you. I mean. Uh, 
if we look into future scenarios, uh, they're always very uh, innovative, uh, 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 changing challenge uh, scenarios. However, if we then see how much has become true, uh, this kind of scenarios, visionary thinking, helps us also to innovate. However, uh, it is then in the end also us to decide to go there or not. And some things we cannot prevent, like the push of the internet to people really using it, uh, we cannot stop it. And uh, that this opens ways, doors for criminals, uh, terrorist uh, groups, uh, we also need to carefully think of that consequences, which we don't do very often. Yeah, there's a social responsibility in designing this kind of model. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That's why I think we need collaborative work uh, of the different teams. And even the, not only, well, I think it is important to separate the, the uh, hardcore science that needs to advance the models and the basic concepts. But then we need those who bring this into the market uh, and need to reflect also ethically uh, technology assessment uh, needs to be carefully done, but uh, we don't, I think we don't enough train that competences. Good, shall we make a break? Thank you very much for your discussion and uh, <laughs> enjoy the lunch break. Thank you. <laughs> so, techniques settled. Welcome back to after lunch. Uh, I hope you could enjoy the lunch time. And uh, yeah, let's uh, discuss it in the next hour or so, something like an hour. Uh, one example of our policy modeling. Uh, it's a concrete project we have been involved in. Uh, it was funded by the European Commission, where we try to combine stakeholder engagement and develop uh, well, conceptual solutions, tools uh, to support policy modeling and um, particularly policy formulation in this context. The overall aims of uh, OCOPOMO uh, are, first of all, it is uh, ICT driven to provide uh, means ICT support for policy modeling, the context that we have been discussing before. And our, uh, we had uh, three uh, case environments, uh, three policy areas. One was renewable energy, Another one was housing policy in London. Renewable energy was in the Košice self-governing region in the Slovakia. Uh, and the third one was uh, knowledge transfer in the region of uh, Naples uh, using structural funds of the European Commission. Or, yeah. And uh, then our oral objective uh, of uh, Okopomo, besides uh, the tool development was then to provide uh, more effective uh, and efficient means for policy analysis and modeling with uh, the use of social simulation. Here we use the aging-based uh, policy modeling, the paradigm of uh, social behavior analysis, and enable uh, collaboration among the different actors that are involved in a certain policy environment. So for example, in, if we take the renewable energy uh, case, we had uh, the households that have to decide uh, what energy they want to use. Are they more on renewables? Are they satisfied with uh, the energy uh, provider? And uh, in that region, it is uh, a gas, gas company because uh, the region imports gas from uh, Russia. And or is it uh, another technology? So the citizens also have uh, decisions. Uh, which are in this case the households. Then of course we have the region policy makers uh, who have to decide uh, which uh, future policy they should support. And there is one interesting thing in that environment. Um, they have um, an old contract with the gas provider which is owned by a Rus Russian company and it is difficult to get out of that contract. However, uh, the city and the region, they have the objective to uh, reduce that uh, gas uh, consumption and to go more into renewable energy. Then the question is also, well, what energy, renewable energy uh, plants are effective in their region? 
Do they have enough uh, soil? Uh, uh, do they have, uh, do they have um, enough sun? Do they have enough wind? Do they have water options, geothermal options, biogas? What are the options that are reasonable in their region? In order to set up a program to fund and to uh, further companies in that particular area to provide energy resources for the city or the region. So this is the policy context. So that means also that potential uh, energy providers can be stakeholders uh, as well as, of course, the one gas uh, owner, um, gas prod production owner is another uh, key stakeholder in this context. And then uh, we had the idea to bring together, on the one side, evidence-based uh, policy modeling uh, approaches, that means using scenarios, using data available, background documents, inform the policy from existing uh, evidences and enable the stakeholders to participate by expressing their own opinion through scenarios, through narrative stories, uh, that means instruments in a very simple way. Uh, then we have uh, on the one side the narrative scenarios, text-based, or PDF, uh, or also images, uh, whatever the, the stakeholders provide. And on the other side, as we want to employ social simulations to understand the behavior and what uh, citizens think or the different stakeholders think is most uh, effective in this policy environment uh, for renewable energy, um, in order to exploit the different opinions and the different options for the energy uh, change to renewables, we need formal policy models to understand uh, the, the behavior and uh, the opinions. And these formal policy models need to be informed by the scenarios which come from the stakeholders and also from uh, the uh, uh, policy owners, in this case, for example, the uh, region of um, uh, Kosice in Slovakia. Now, the big problem then here was uh, we have on the one side narrative texts, PDF documents, etc. On the other hand, we need formal statements, rules, agent descriptions, fact descriptions in a formal way. So we needed to combine that. And hence, our idea was we need an intermediary tool in between that helps us uh, to structure the policy context in a conceptual model and then feed hopefully, in an automated way, this kind of uh, structure into a simulation model. And this is uh, our overall approach. We have uh, delivered in this project uh, different artifacts. On the one hand, a um, policy development process that involves the stakeholders. Uh, so we called it uh, integrated policy process and involved actors. Um, that is as follows. Certainly, there is at first hand a policy owner. A policy owner is the one policy making actor that can be a corporation, it can be also a group of individuals uh, that is responsible for the subsequent implementation of the policy. In our case, uh, they have, of course, the expertise, and usually they make uh, their decisions in their closed environment. We can call this a black box. We don't know what decision making is behind it. Our aim is to make this more transparent. Hence, we start with, with the information uh, from their side, uh, try to come up with an initial scenario that they want to have their policy developed into. Uh, so they describe and outline their objectives in their initial policy. And they provide background documents to be provided on a stakeholder engagement platform. And here come the stakeholder in where we then say, OK, stakeholders, please uh, have a look at these documents, have a look at the ideas of uh, the initial policy draft, and give us your own ideas. And do this by describing your own scenario of how the policy should look like. So we gather, on the one side, scenarios. We call them stakeholder-generated uh, uh, scenarios. We call them also evidence-based because the stakeholders uh, should not only claim 
a few, but they should also provide the background information uh, for that few and for that uh, options that they suggest. So we collect the ideas of the stakeholders plus uh, the evidence that uh, grounds the ideas. And out of this uh, stakeholder bus based scenario, we need then to construct our policy model, the conceptual model. This is what we call here development of the conceptual model. And this is done, uh, you see the smileys here, the smileys means the blue ones are the domain experts, so the policy owner, the policy planners, uh, strategic decision makers involved. Um, the orange ones are the stakeholders, so you see they come in in step two here. And then the, the yellow smileys, these are the experts for policy analysis and modeling. So in the first cases, uh, those uh, policy consultants uh, that speak with uh, uh, the policy owners uh, or that speak uh, with the stakeholders, moderators. And here in, in the step three, now we need those experts who are able to extract from narrative text, from background documents, from background data, um, a conceptual model of the policy. Hence, uh, here this is uh, experts uh, involved for policy analysis. And this uh, box up here is iterative because stakeholders come up with suggestions, then they uh, get feedback, they get into dialogue, and iteratively also the conceptual model grows. And then at a certain point we say, okay, we have a good understanding now of our policy case, and now we want to develop our simulation model, the policy simulation model. This is uh, step four here. It's done by also the programmers. In our case, we have also a separate tool developed, which is uh, based on declarative agent-based modeling, and the tool is called GRAMS. It is a repast-based uh, uh, technology, so uh, a uh, simulation environment, uh, Java-based in the end, uh, for multi-agent programming. However, GRAMS is dec uh, declarative-oriented. Uh, um, modeling. And then when this is done, uh, simulation runs are done to provoke uh, outputs uh, to generate new insights of the simulation that we can uh, do through the uh, simulation models. And this uh, simulation uh, models are of two types. On the one side, you have, of course, the data, the, the ticks, uh, the output puts uh, from uh, the individual uh, steps in the simulation run. And this needs, of course, to be translated for the stakeholders into, again, some narratives that tell the story of the simulation results. So we call this then simulation-generated uh, models or model-based scenarios. And the next step is then to expose these simulation results to the stakeholders. Hence, again, the stakeholders come in, also the policy owners come in again, and on the platform uh, we have the common dialogue uh, where these people discuss about what they learn from the simulation models. This can be new insights, this can be, ah, I didn't mean it like this in my scenario, so they correct their own scenario or they revise the scenario, they add something new, they add a new scenario because they gain insight from this uh, formalized scenario uh, simulation results um, of uh, the simulation. And hence, this can be iterated in several steps until they come to a conclusion, OK, now we are satisfied. Uh, we have a common understanding of our policy domain. We have understood what the options are. We think that the simulation model correctly produces the different produ uh, positions that are uh, on, uh, on air in, in a certain policy environment. In this case, for example, in the Kosice region, and they say, OK, um, now we can make our decision. And uh, this uh, process. So here in this process, we go from basically we support the policy modeling, policy formulation in the cycle. And we also support policy evaluation because this can also be uh, done ex post. So uh, to get an insight into how, for example, funds are distributed. This was our Napoli case. Uh, this was uh, for policy evaluation. 
next step is uh, we have understood the process. The next point is, well, what are the kinds of artifacts that we are generating along this uh, uh, process? And this is, uh, as I mentioned already before, uh, in the initial search, we have an initial scenario from the policy owner plus uh, background documents that inform this initial scenario, provide the evidence also for the few in statement. Then in the stakeholder engagement phase, we get the stakeholder generated uh, scenarios as well as uh, further background documents. And then uh, what we do with this in the stage three, and this is because uh, how the CCD, consistent conceptual descriptions, uh, is spanning over the three phases. Actually, we take these documents generated from the previous three, uh, two phases, annotate them, try to identify the key concepts of the policy domain. That means actors, actions, conditions, other world facts that are probably described in the scenarios or in the background document. And with this, we, extract, uh, we con uh, create our conceptual model that means uh, the ontology on one side as well as uh, actor um, and the actions diagram on the other side. So what kind of causal activities uh, can be viewed in the scenario. And sometimes what we also realized is that we don't gather all the information for uh, a simulation run from the stakeholders. That means we also can annotate expert knowledge and add expert knowledge from the simulation modelers, from the policy analysts, into our conceptual model. These are the yellow smileys here uh, in this concept. So this is uh, step three. Then we have uh, the conceptual model, which is uh, CCD. We call it uh, consistent uh, conceptual descriptions. Next step is then to transform this conceptual model into a simulation model, into uh, facts, fact templates, and rules, if then else conditions, for example. And run the simulation and interpret the simulation outputs into, again, um, a model-based uh, scenario. So this is, again, narrative description interpreting uh, the results which are then fed back uh, in the different stages as we have seen before on the process. Now, the challenges that are here are we need to transform narrative unstructured texts into a structure. So we have assumed context, background uh, documents, narr narrative scenarios, which we collect over an e-participation platform. In this case, we have used a web content management system uh, with uh, uh, extensions uh, and we based it on Alfresco. Several of you may know Alfresco. Then uh, we structure this knowledge into our CCD, the consistent conceptual descriptions, using the tool, CCD tool that we have implemented. That means, as I said before, identifying actors, attributes, relationships, the objects uh, that are uh, in our environment. If we take our uh, Koshitze case, what, who would be actors? Some examples, some ideas. Do you call, recall any actors that I mentioned? The question. The question would now be um, from the scenario of uh, the Koshitze region, uh, renewable energy. I mentioned actors before. The concept of actor here means from our scenario, and the question is, <coughs> which actors, for example, did I mention before that would be actors in our concept? Any ideas? State? Yes, the state, single the, the single households, the, the, the city government, yeah. The well, the pol you need to assign the policy makers uh, to certain corporations or in a certain role, like a role would then be, but the, yeah, yeah, they are actors, right? And you assign them certain roles. However, in, in the uh, simulation, you don't state uh, 
for example, individual actors like a city administrator, you, the city administrator is considered as the role that you take as the act agent in the end that takes action. You're not going down to the instance level. So uh, objects, what would be objects that we need to deal with? Any ideas? Yeah, energy, the energy, uh, the technology to produce the, e produce the energy, right? In terms of document, we need a bit uh, more uh, specificity, like the policy document could be uh, one of the, the revenue, yeah, the costs, for example. Well, actually, the, the costs are usually affiliated to certain technology of energy or energy. So there could be attributes, actually, of objects. And then we have probably relationship, like a, a heat producer uses a particular technology to, and this is an object, so we have the heat producer uses is the relationship, a particular technology to produce energy, electricity in this case. So this, this is the way how we build up the models then and structure the policy domain. And, uh, we could, for example, then say, okay, we have um, our city government uh, or the regional government, which has a policy document, and in this policy document, it has the objective uh, to reduce the dependency of uh, gas from uh, Russia. That could be one of the policy objectives, which is then uh, formulated here. We have another one. Uh, the gas producer has no interest to change the contract. It's also something uh, to be modeled here. Now, this is then, f as a first step, it comes, for example, we have here the contract with the heat producer. We have uh, uh, background documents that document how effective uh, gas, uh, sorry, uh, solar, uh, water, plants, etc., would be, renewables would be. And uh, we transfer this into uh, the conceptual model, and then we need to transform this into uh, agent, agent rules, uh, individual facts, as well as uh, uh, world facts that help us uh, describe the simulation environment. And this is what we do with DRAM's declarative rule-based agent modeling system. These uh, tools are the ones that we have implemented here. This is our concept and the challenge of transformation that we uh, wanted to resolve with our approach. And I think uh, coming back to um, Stephen's uh, presentation earlier today, I think uh, this could be some tool that uh, might be quite interesting to you in your context also. Now, let's look a bit uh, more into the details. Uh, so this uh, is then uh, uh, the toolbox uh, provided uh, we have on the upper part the interaction with the stakeholders, the different stakeholders, the facilitators in our concept are the roles that help uh, the stakeholders uh, to be in dialogue, moderators, to, to have interviews also, etc. Uh, and to discuss online uh, the scenarios uh, or to develop the scenarios online using the Alfresco platform. So the Alfresco platform then provides a repository uh, with uh, storing content, um, user management procedures, uh, and uh, extraction of uh, that knowledge into our uh, simulation environment later on. And it provides e participation facilities like polling, chatting, uh, rating, the collaborative space, so to say. Now, from that upper part, we come into in the Step three, uh, the CCD tool environment, which allows us the, the construction of this conceptual model uh, and which helps us also transform the conceptual model into an initial uh, simulation model through a transformation um, um, program. We call it CCD to drums transformation. And uh, then uh, the program is further done. What do you think is the biggest challenge of uh, the transformation from the conceptual model into the simulation environment? Hmm? Uh, mm. The parameters, which ones? Uh, no, no. 
It's particular, yeah, but which concept that we mentioned before? Which concept here is probably most, oh, it's not written, yeah, it's, it's written here. The conditions partially, but one is really very, very tricky because the, yeah, the behavior is related to what? Also, these two, the actions actually. These two, the actions and the behavior are the ones that need the programming hands of the social simulation experts. Because the actors are easily transferable into the agents. The, we have uh, the mapping, the translation is no problem. The objects, the same. So these are the concepts which are stable. Um, the relationships which uh, are then formulated also into behavior and actions, these are the tricky things. Be and these are not formulated, they are, well, they are not formulated in a way to be as precise as you need them in the simulation model. So we didn't have, if you have, if anybody of you is interested in doing a qualification thesis in this area, we will be very interesting uh, in that. Because this is the tricky thing to formalize a more vague concept of uh, actions of behavior into uh, the programming, into a formalized uh, statement, set of statements, into the rules in the end. So this is where we are uh, doing the work, the, where the experts do their work. Um, so we have then here the simulation environment uh, with uh, uh, rules uh, and running the simulations then, visualizations. And when we run simulations, we generate also the model-based scenarios and feed them back again to the uh, collaboration and scenario editing environment to be uh, to pro provided for the interaction with uh, the stakeholders. This kind of platform uh, can be provided uh, in open uh, environments. So the project was called Open Collaboration. However, we also saw that policy owners are not always that open, so they let in a smaller set of stakeholders. Actually, in our um, two cases, uh, in, the, uh, in the Naples region, they were a bit more open, but uh, the other two were very restrictive in terms of uh, who the stakeholders are that will be participating here. So they told us the names that we then could in invite uh, for the uh, stakeholder engagement. However, the environment enables both. Good. Now, uh, this I can provide anyway the slides later on. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. No problem. Um, so, uh, this shows once again the process that we saw before the artifacts that are being generated and the blue uh, outer circle indicates which tool is being used. I, I don't uh, think I need to go into the details, however, uh, just to structure this once again. Now, this uh, three components, the CCD tool comprises of uh, three components, uh, transforming the um, narrative text, the, PDF, uh, the text documents, into conceptual descriptions with the uh, annotation tool and the conceptual description tool enabling this conceptual modeling and transforming uh, this conceptual model in the end into an initial not complete uh, formal policy model through the CCD to trans tool. Also here there is research potential because at the moment uh, this tool and it is also used uh, in an ex post environment uh, of analyzing uh, the fall down of uh, criminal structures in Italy, the mafia structures, uh, and, uh, they have used uh, this tool in another environment for post uh, ex post analysis of the fall down of uh, certain mafia structures in uh, Sicily. And the conceptual models help the uh, people from the police department uh, quite well to understand the concepts uh, uh, behind the simulation models in the end. So it helped very much uh, for structuring. There is one more thing uh, that is uh, important here, 
uh, this annotation tool stores the links back to the narrative texts, and this annotation are uh, assigned with UIDs, and this uh, indications is then transferred into each of the next steps, so we enable traceability of our provenance information in the simulation models. Another important aspect that to understand from the simulation which rules have fired uh, on what basis of statements of stakeholders have this happened. This is another aspect of uh, support. Now the next slides uh, detail a bit uh, the concept of uh, consistent conceptual descriptions because this uh, breach between narrative text and uh, the formal statements has uh, been a very essential part to support both the information to stakeholders to better understand in a conceptual model the policy domain and also those uh, simulation modelers at the end, uh, the, the formal programmers, uh, to understand bugs and to, to do uh, uh, compiling and understand uh, which rules have fired, which actors were active in a simulation run and see what was wrong. So to go back uh, through the annotations and through uh, the trace to the conceptual model to understand what's, what happened. And in this way, it speeds up uh, the programming uh, process of uh, generating simulation models enormously. And the research need here is actually further that we only have this for drums, but there are other um, simulation environments like NetLogo, et cetera, um, which would also need such a support. Another field for research. Now, consistent conceptual descriptions. Consistent means uh, making uh, modeling decisions traceable for stakeholders, as I just explained. Uh, text phrases from source scenarios and background text are linked with the conceptual descriptions to enable this traceability uh, and the semi-automatic transformation uh, towards uh, the simulation environment is a very important uh, um, uh, step also to uh, speed up the process, as I uh, mentioned before. And what is further interesting and important is that when we then describe the model-based scenario, so the simulation outcome is interpreted, we again link this back to the conceptual model, so to have uh, uh, also there the traceability. Unfortunately, this work has to be done manually at the moment. Uh, this uh, annotation then, uh, well, it is uh, supported in the tool environment, however, um, when the model interpreter writes uh, the model-based narrative uh, to interpret the data of the simulation, this has then to be linked uh, manually back to the conceptual model. This is the way how it works at the moment. So the conceptual uh, model being also very important to provide a better understanding, to grasp um, um, the concept uh, behind and to structure and the, the policy domain and to be able to manage the comple uh, complexity in the end. Which, and uh, this structuring helps us, as I uh, mentioned before, to semi-automatically transform the concept into uh, models, simulation models. And the descriptions here help us uh, to really understand uh, and document, make it uh, traceable and better understandable in the end also to the different stakeholders. Now, this is uh, the meta model of our, our concept. So we have uh, the ontology part, which describes the basic concept, like we have actor, we have the uh, object. These are our concepts of the CCD. Concepts, actors, objects can be in relationship. Uh, and uh, in order to trigger actions, the behavior described here, uh, we have the actions. And these are described also with action input, action output, so what conditions are uh, at the beginning, what conditions are firing the next uh, action, and what is the end state of that action, so uh, output uh, relationships. And then uh, these concepts, they are described also with the attributes, so an actor has certain attributes, an object has certain attributes, like the price uh, for a certain energy would be an attribute here in this concept, uh, or um, yeah, uh, certain renewable energy, uh, certain attributes of that technology would be described in attributes. And then we have uh, the instance uh, environment, uh, the facts uh, with uh, 
like we have uh, geothermal uh, technology, we have uh, the different uh, actors uh, like heat producer, household, um, city government, that will all be uh, instances described in, in that facts environment. This is uh, our meta model and this of course is then uh, detailed and elaborated. It's implemented in the CCD tool and it allows them to develop for each policy domain the specific conceptual model. Yeah, and I think this is more the theory behind it. I already uh, explained. Uh, it is very important to have these uh, concepts, to structure them, to manage in the end complexity. So the CCD meta model serves as blueprint for the vocabulary and uh, for describing the policy case in the end. Now this is uh, a screenshot of uh, the tool, the first step, so the annotations. We have taken the scenarios from the website, from the uh, alfresco uh, environment where citizens or the different stakeholders that participated in the Kosice region, this is a scenario from Kosice region, uh, described uh, the view of uh, the policy environment from their case. So I'm reading out uh, briefly, I'm a Kosice citizen, citizen and I'm a uh, retired director of the power plant in Kosice. I'm not a decision maker anymore, so I can express only my opinion how uh, good energy policy could look like. So it's a storytelling. However, in this context then, this uh, guy describes the heat consumption in Kosice city in recent years decreased substantially. Um, so they talk about, uh, we can say that this is uh, thanks to new technologies and better insulation of buildings. So the insulation of buildings plays an important role for the household for energy consumption. Currently we have in Kosice one very strong and dominant heat producer, it's called TECO, which uses gas from Russia and uh, coal from Ukraine. Uh, the proportion of sources is uh, circa one to one coal and gas. Uh, this power plant, uh, so I don't, uh, I'm not able to read the next part. Um, the current technology is working well from the producer's economic point of view. Um, so he tells a story with a lot of uh, interesting aspects. What we then do is to, to take these text scenarios and to annotate them and to generate our conceptual model. So for example, here highlighted heat producer and the instance would be TECO. We have a concept uh, which is actor and the concrete instance of the actor is heat producer. And then uh, you see the one marked uh, file annotation, heat producer, which is then linked back to the, this uh, text and we store these references. So when we then navigate through this concept alone, uh, you see here different tabs uh, which uh, describe different uh, graphical models and uh, the different scenarios. We can navigate through all of this and see the different information from which we have uh, generated our conceptual model. And this is now, for example, the actor diagram. Uh, we see here, for example, the city. Uh, so the uh, circles are actors, the rectangles are uh, objects. And uh, the lines uh, show relationships and uh, are also um, uh, described. So for example, the city consumes energy uh, and the uh, technology uh, produces a particular energy, so uh, particular uh, heat, heating uh, technologies is meant here. And the heat producers, the actor produces the kind of uh, uh, energy and uses for this certain technology. And this heat agree, uh, producer has probably agreement uh, with other heat producers or has <coughs> also agreement uh, with others. I don't want to explain everything. It should show what are the relationships, the main actor relationships in this policy context. Then we have also the actions uh, diagram, which uh, here is a very simplified model, shows Okay, uh, we have uh, to look as a household for uh, alternative uh, solutions. We found them also and then we have to decide whether we use them or not. 
uh, and by the technology or this is a heat producer that should look for alternatives. Um, yeah, and uh, on another angle from the citizen side or household side, energy price is high, so that triggers investment into a uh, reduction of uh, energy consumption. That would be one option, or as it is written here, in alternative uh, energies. This should just show the concept here. Now, what we, when we have uh, generated uh, actually this tree, so the ontology, the overall structure, including uh, the actor diagram and the actions diagram. The next step is then to transform this into uh, an initial simulation model. Uh, how is this done? We have seen the meta model. We have the CCD, um, um, as we have just shown it. And then on the, the other side, usually, you have a meta model for the simulation environment. Uh, and this, needs, uh, this generates instantiations, individual simulation models. Now, what we have then done is uh, to write up a transformation definition that maps the conceptual model of uh, the meta model of the CCD into the drums meta model. It's not one to one because the concepts are a bit <coughs> different. And on the instance level, of course, this needs also to translate, for example, the actors here into the agents here, the facts that are described here into the facts here. Um, the objects are being translated into facts here, etc. And as I said, the actions are the most difficult to be translated and the relationships which uh, are to be fed into the rules. There are no clear, con no unique concepts uh, to do transformation here. So we generate an initial uh, model and uh, we store the traces also. So what we are able then is to see um, the text from the scenario in our environment. We are on the eclipse environment. Um, the annotation in uh, the CCD. Here we have the heat producer concept, for example, uh, and the text annotation. And this is transformed into uh, the uh, RAMS code, Java code in this case, of course, where, for example, the annotations are also added, which are very important for uh, the programmers because they can then uh, directly go back to the conceptual model to investigate what is actually meant here. For example, what does the heat producer in terms of actions to program this further, the actions in this case. And the annotations are stored also for then when uh, the simulation run is done, uh, the uh, simulation log. Uh, records ev for every tick the activities, uh, what uh, rules have fired, what actors were involved, etc., to what conditions. Uh, and it adds also the UUID to be able to go back to the conceptual model. Yeah, uh, showing you the concepts here. In the simula simulation environment, it's also possible to visualize uh, the structure of the programming code uh, with um, different uh, rules uh, uh, and actors that are, well, the actors that are firing based on a certain rules uh, and taking certain actions in the end that feed to a certain result. And this is then uh, possible to investigate, to link together. And this enables uh, the traceability, how we implemented it in our tool. This is a more sophisticated model. Uh, you see this is very complex. Uh, the first one was a bit zooming in. Um, but uh, it helps very much uh, to the policy modelers then to understand better the complexity. It's also possible in the CCD tool to uh, uh, hide different concepts that you are not interested in and then to navigate from one concept that you want to look at into the next one. And then it opens the relationships uh, and so this way uh, you can better investigate individual aspects. However, then you are able also to master better the complexity of the whole thing. Yeah, um, what is important here is uh, the, the CCD tool. As uh, uh, we, we see here, this concept links basically the text with the formal models. 
um, for the simulation and uh, from the simulation environment, this is a log file. Uh, you can uh, select one and then in this tool naviga navigate back uh, to see from where you came from and where this uh, rule was informed, which helps foremost, I need to say, uh, the policy modelers with some more uh, new um, and simpler visualization is able, it's also possible to expose these conceptual models to the stakeholders to enable them also to understand better the complexity of a simulation model. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned uh, all this. This is uh, our implementation. As I mentioned, we have uh, three policy cases. Uh, the first and the third one are for policy development and the competence centers is uh, exposed evaluation. So it's uh, in terms of the policy life cycle we have talked earlier today, it is uh, the evaluation step. Uh, I do have another example case here from the Campania region showing you again, actually, so I'm, I'm not going into the details much, um, but shows again the traceability aspect a more complicated actor network diagram. Here we have also, this is a newer version, uh, also added the uh, attributes to a concept. So we have uh, uh, automatic funding here um, to service providers, uh, to enterprises, um, just as attributes uh, that uh, are assigned here. And this is an uh, action diagram starting from above here. We, we can start from bot top, uh, bottom up or top down, reading uh, the models. Here in this case, it was modeled uh, uh, from top down. Renewable, uh, uh, this is uh, on funding, uh, structural funds uh, for knowledge transfer. So in, in the Naples region, um, the region, in order to uh, spur uh, economic growth, receives structural funds from the European Commission. And uh, the region has to decide uh, which projects to fund. So at a certain step, uh, an, a program needs to be renewed to call for proposals. And in this case, the idea was to support knowledge transfer from the universities uh, to companies small and medium enterprises, particularly in the um, cultural heritage area. Uh, Naples region is very rich of cultural heritage, and uh, there are lots of, there's a lot of knowledge in academia on how to uh, restore uh, paintings, uh, architecture, uh, architectural uh, heritage buildings, uh, um, ruins, whatever is there. A lot is there, and the knowledge is in with uh, the universities. But however, to to enable uh, growth of economy, uh, the idea of the structural fund is then to give money to small and medium enterprises that are evolving as spin-offs from the university, taking the knowledge of the university of academia and apply it in concrete uh, business environments. They get funding for the first uh, two to three years, then they are evaluated, and after three years they should uh, be self-sustaining. And uh, the, the region has to decide which of uh, the proposals are most promising to really pay off in the end, and which not to fund. And uh, this, uh, they used uh, this uh, simulation modeling then to evaluate how good the project was performing. So this uh, action diagram describes uh, a bit how the decisions are being made uh, for renewing a program. Uh, then they need to set up a call for proposals. Um, uh, they need to set up uh, the uh, evaluation time, uh, build a new consortium. This is uh, on the one side the promoting agency, on the other side the service providers. The service providers pr prepare uh, the proposals. They look uh, into the conditions for the proposals, need to decide I submit or not, uh, give it a name, um, probably also uh, get into partnerships with other uh, partners. And yeah, uh, then they submit uh, the proposal, which has to be evaluated by the uh, promoting agency, uh, which does the evaluation, and then selects the proposals uh, and endorses uh, them, and also the partners are being. So this 
shows uh, the action diagram in uh, what has been modeled here. And again, we see the traceability. I don't want to investigate this further. But uh, what I wanted to show you here also, uh, this chart is a, a result of the simulation model. We have used also the visualization of um, simple web charts uh, simulations uh, to uh, visualize the results indicating well which uh, companies or uh, service providers are most successful. So we have, for example, here Benecon, that is, uh, and Innova, these are the two most successful innovators uh, in that region that uh, are successful with spin-offs and with uh, projects also. And uh, that simulation visualization is then also transformed into a narrative, uh, and this is being annotated then also again with the CCD model. So it's possible to navigate and back also to the conceptual model and to yeah, go back to the uh, scenario statements. Yeah, so far the practical part of uh, this uh, implementation. Now, final question, why combining scenario development and formal policy modeling? And I'd like to share uh, some thoughts, uh, some benefits that we have uh, thought of um, from this project. Well, first of all, stakeholder in participation is facilitated because using scenarios, it's easier for the stakeholders. They don't need to learn a particular uh, formal language, uh, like modeling language or a formal specification. They just tell in their language, in narrative storytelling, uh, what their views are, and they can sub support their statements through uh, providing background documents. So scenario development then is bottom up. It involves the stakeholders. Uh, we enable the comparison of uh, the scenario-based uh, models with the model-generated uh, uh, scenarios in, in the evaluation step. So the stakeholders are involved in iterative uh, steps, uh, and this helps them also to develop an understanding. So it is also kind of a contribution to the formation, to the information, to, pro, uh, to develop the knowledge about the policy case, about the understanding, to be informed in the decision making. And yeah, uh, we use uh, innovative tools uh, to uh, enable the stakeholders to participate without particular competency in policy modeling concepts in the end. Sorry? Ah, information communication technology. Okay. So, yeah. Um, sorry, <laughs> I didn't explain it because um, uh, it is uh, common knowledge in my domain. Of course, it is not in every domain. Sorry for that. Uh, my fault. Good. Um, so, why integrating this? Two approaches, on the one hand, uh, non-formal narrative uh, views of the stakeholders. Uh, uh, this helps us to bring in, involve uh, the stakeholders uh, to get uh, their understanding and uh, to understand what their motivations are for certain uh, strands of uh, developments. And it is also um, kind of a social process innovation that is being supported here. The formal policy models produce simulations which are more precise, uh, precise. they need to be formal, uh, um, and uh, this means we need to come from both sides. The one is to get informed, evidence-based, through natural language on the other side. In order to run the simulations, we need precise formulations, which are very good uh, combinations. It may be cumbersome, however, through the conceptual tool, we have the CCD tool, it becomes manageable and it informs better. And yeah, the participating stakeholders evaluate uh, the model generated scenarios uh, where, well, they may generate new insights, uh, they may see uh, um, what the options are and uh, get a better understanding and accept certain decisions in the end. So we have complementarity of the two approaches. 
Uh, first of all, in the chaining, the scenarios uh, are built in with an objective, with a goal in mind by uh, the citizens, by the stakeholders. The models are built from the behavioral and contextual evidence uh, of the scenarios using forward chaining rules. We have richness and precision. Uh, the scenarios provide richness of information, while we need the precision uh, in the formal statements in the uh, simulation model, and we have exploration and exploitation. The exploration, the new ideas generation through the scenarios, and uh, the exploitation uh, in terms of uh, models facilitating simulation models and the results thereof uh, facilitating the understanding of prevailing context of certain policy contexts. That means we have uh, three levels of uh, scientific and technological uh, innovations here. The socio-political formulation, modeling, evaluation of social and economic strategies for governance and uh, for monitoring over time. The open participation, the discussions we started earlier today in the, um, in, in the presentation before lunch. Uh, methodological integrated approach supporting complexity management and uh, enabling traceability, so better understanding, more transparency also, and integrating uh, the stakeholder combining also different methodological approaches and technologically, particularly with uh, the CCD uh, environment uh, and uh, with participation environments and the trans uh, traceability. So what are the key uh, value adds of the approach? Traceability, I think uh, I mentioned that already, increasing trust, uh, supporting policy models in conceptualization of the policy domain uh, and uh, the CCD being an important in intermediary to support this traceability, but also to manage complexity and support policy modeling. And what are the uh, contributions uh, to a wider impact of our solution uh, that we have implemented here, contributing to strategic policy making and implementing open government along policy development, transforming government and administrations to open, effective, and efficient participative governance, uh, providing new opportunities for open discourse among the stakeholders, and improving transparency and traceability in this strategic decision making. It's a, a tool uh, that, or a tool environment with uh, uh, different paradigms that support uh, this uh, uh, application of tools and uh, that um, combine the different approaches of scenario development, stakeholder engagement, and formal simulation based on agent-based modeling here, which are certainly very, very important for future policy development. However, uh, in reality, uh, it is, I think, uh, in, in the previous uh, presentation of uh, Stephen, also we had the discussion with Stefan, well, how ready is government uh, to apply such tool? And I think this will also still take some time that this such a concept becomes reality. However, we are seeking for contexts where we can explore this further. And this is also something I'd like to mention then. Those students who are at university here, if you're interested in a master thesis here, please talk to us. Uh, we can find an interesting context here, exploring maybe even combined uh, topics uh, that we heard early in the morning from Stephen uh, and exploring the environment that we can provide. Or developing this further, as we also saw that we need some further developments here. That's what I wanted to share with you, some literature. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> questions from your side, further questions. It's not the case, yeah? What, what would the results uh, look like? So it would seem like uh, something like, would this person's probability, this outcome will occur, or? Um, not necessarily probabilities, but showing, OK, if you have a set of parameters, for example, here, renewable energy, that will tell you, OK, people will accept this more than that one. So it should be. Uh, invested more in, in uh, 
wind energy also because it is more effective uh, and the technical details tell also that this is more, brings more capacity. Something like that. So less probability, but more in this terms of facts. Also, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. In the end, uh, we also talked to. Uh, we had one policy consultant here, so they also use, uh, for example, NetLogo for programming such policy contexts. However, they do this in closed environments, so the models are secrets and the results are also secrets. They are only in an interpreted way communicated then to their politicians. So yes, it is a tool that can be used also by the politicians. However, the idea is to involve wider stakeholder audiences and to make this process more transparent. Now, we had a discussion earlier already that transparency, even though we have uh, transparency acts uh, and the desire to become more open, the reality is still on the other side. So, of course, it can be in closed environments uh, certainly used. So, for example, a political party could take it for exploring its own environment and letting only their members participate. As I told you, in the um, Kosice region and also in the London housing, only selected stakeholders were invited to participate. Uh, there is a user management uh, available. So. Um, the policy owners define who should participate. However, the tool is designed to let also people openly discuss and get so, insight. Um, I think nowadays uh, the technology offers the possibility that, for example, uh, there's a question in the parliament mm -hmm. and they yeah, don't know what uh, the situation is with the population. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. The point, however, is then, is it done openly? Is it done in closed environment? How transparent is it done? And how participative is it done? So the problem is not the technology as such, but the problem is the willingness and the preparedness of uh, those who decide to do it or not to do it, which is an organizational, psychological, cognitive problem? Yeah. 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 Hmm? Normally, it's normally uh, used uh, for many stakeholders and very complex at the moment. Do you think you could also model behavior with like a, one individual's behavior or one individual's yeah. psychology? Well, this is actually what we started from uh, because uh, uh, the programmers that, the simulation programmers that were involved here were used to model individuals. Now, in our environments, we had then uh, groups of stakeholders, uh, let's say 500 households um, that you need to needed to model. Then it didn't make sense anymore to model 500 individual agents. So it was aggregated. However, the starting point was individuals. That might and also give you a, a way to get to the operationalizing the behavior. That yeah. Would be yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting to discuss with you. And uh, I wish you a great afternoon and hand over to Steffen now. Well, I don't have much to say. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Oh. <laughs> for spending the uh, afternoon. <laughs> and thank for you. Your presentation and thank you very much. Being it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy and probably see so. some of you tomorrow on the yes. wine walk, yes. <laughs> one year walk.